All right, so as you can tell, this is run as a, an interactive session. I already began with Laura. I don't Laura. use PowerPoint. It's much more interactive, so if you have questions or things come up as we go along or comments you want to make, please do make them. Uh, that's how it works. Um, um, so, yep, I think so. I've gotten the questions already, but I think um, so. Me, obviously, a uh, lecturer at school, and um, in terms of what I hope to get out of here, well, okay, I'll let you know this. So I had two failed mm. ARCs in mm. the last round, um, and <laughs> I'm going for another one <gasps> in this next round. So there you go. Uh, and there's not much time. No. And I see here it says it takes time. It does. <laughs> <laughs> and one question, do I have sufficient time? Well, okay, I have six weeks. So, um, but we do have to do have a draft as it is already, uh, and it's a good idea. It's um, examining, so as most of you will know, we have data on the homicide offenders, it's, uh, and particularly intimate partner homicide offenders, uh, but we need a, a, a control to be able to say that something is uh, you know, associated with, with lethal violence, we need to have a control group. So in this study, we're building on the data that we already have, that's how we're selling it, we have this data, rich data, and but we need this non-lethal sample in order to be able to make comparisons across. So we're, um, yeah. Okay. Anyway, I'd that's like to talk with you more about your project. Um, I would say that if it looks too similar to the last time, I'd be a little bit concerned. Mm -hmm. But when I gave this presentation to the law group uh, last month, Sue Berner Price said she had failed three times with a similar grant, and then mm -hmm. she finally got her future fellowship. So mm -hmm. the, the general advice is persevere. Mm -hmm. But I'd be concerned uh, if it's looking too similar to the last ones that haven't gone off. No, this is different. Different. OK. This is different. All right. Very different. Actually. Okay, and so what you're hoping to learn is how to be successful this time. Is that right? <laughs> 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 okay. Susan, I, uh, can I just say one yes, more thing? Please. How to sell a, a criminology project in this day and age where criminology is a difficult discipline to be in? Um, uh, it's it's divided. Uh, if you you go to the wrong person, they don't mind mm. your, uh, where you come from, your institution, <laughs> the, your quantitative approach, etc. Mm. they'll push you away and, and that's where you get that support. So I just, uh, yeah, how, how best to sell it, and, I mean, we're considering going to psychology this time around. Anyway, that was it. Yes, it's, it, that part of the process can be a bit demoralizing. Mm -hmm. um, also have some I mean, quantitative projects do get up. Mm. Look at Chris, Tina Murphy's uh, yeah. and Adrian Journey yeah. and Susan. I mean, quite a few do. I yeah. mean, that are that are uh, mainstream quantitative. I say mainstream, mainstream. and lots of yeah. numbers compared to. Yeah. I do kind of slipstream, <laughs> slipstream quantitative um, as compared to mainstream. But um, so they do get up. I think. Um, I think it's important to get over the sense that there's a conspiracy there. I really think that's important, otherwise you'll just lose moral strength. Yep. So okay. we'll just have to kind of rejig the mindset there, although that can be difficult. I have a few stories about that to share from law as well. Okay, Susan. Hmm. Hello, Lara, this is Susan Denson. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm just here because uh, we, Matt and I asked Kathy to um, run this seminar and I wanted to come along and um, be supportive and hear what she what advice she's giving to everybody and also hear about the projects that people are planning to do. Um, so I've I've actually sat through Kathy's seminar before. I learned a lot from it. Um, I'm sure I'll learn again today. Anyway. So I hope it's not too repetitive. <laughs> I do add a few jokes, new jokes every <laughs> <week>. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I get a repertoire of stories over the years, so I they, they keep adding up. So uh, yeah, so I can credit, I can get credit for your for your ARC, can I? Yeah, yeah. And as Ingrid Eisenstadter says, it takes time and a team to win grants. She does not mean a team of other scholars. She means a team of reviewers. And so no one person can ever take responsibility, although we all would like to. 
it really is a group of people who, and you need to uh, really gather that group together. I mean, I'd be gathering your names now for reviews, and you'll be aghast to find out how many reviews I get. I'll save that for later. Okay, but lots and lots. And that's what really it's all about. Emily. Hi, I'm Emily, so I'm a lecturer in the school. Um, I only got my PhD at the start of this year, so I don't have, like, same boat as Lara, have some vague ideas of projects I would be looking at in the next three to five years, but I think I'm just here to sort of learn as much about the process and any mm -hmm. hints and tips of future career planning and all that sort of stuff. Excellent. Now, you can hear okay? Yes, there's not only am I mic'd up here, but there's apparently speakers mm -hmm. in the ceiling, so we're being, mm -hmm. we have pick up everywhere. Kirsten? Yeah, I'm Kirsten, I'm a research fellow working for Student Medicine here. Um, I am trying to finish a DECRA uh, in the next six weeks, and uh, it's going to be about the effect of um, imprisonment, rising imprisonment rates in communities on the people living in them. Okay. And, and what do you hope to learn or to contribute today? Well, of course, I have a great proposal. <laughs> <What else? laughs> the money. <laughs> okay, how to, how to get a grant. That's why I'm here. Okay, right. Tariro. Hi, Laura. I'm Tariro. <laughs> she can't see you unless yeah. you really put your hand up very high. See her? <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a postdoc. Uh, well, I'm an adjunct here. I'm a postdoc at UNSW. Don't ask how I got here. <laughs> um, I am here because I have no idea about writing grants. And okay. every time I knew Lee was applying for two, you know, I was expecting her to get it. I was expecting lots of people to get it. And then they don't get them, and you think these are amazing projects. So I'd just like to understand the whole process more. And um, because I come from lots of different, I've got lots of different backgrounds, my mm -hmm. projects aren't really coherent, so mm -hmm. I'm not planning to apply for anything at the moment, but when I do, I'd like to just know how to bring it all together. So you're on that postdoc uh, that is the Clifford Shearing um, yep. project on, what is it, is it on water and yes. sustainability? Yes, yes, yes. Right, okay. Yes. So you're on yet another area. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> You'll have to use your diverse experiences, water, police, you know, put it all together into one global project. Hmm. Matt. So I'm Matthew Brown, uh, research development officer for the next two and a half days. Uh, and then I'm over to the research office. Um, but yeah, so it's a similar position to Susan here to sort of support the process and also yeah, learn some different perspectives on. Matt, people don't. Oh, no, no, we didn't know you were leaving. Right. Okay, so I'm heading over to the research office on a secondment for. Uh, <laughs> So yeah, that'll be yeah. during that. During the the this is a one like this is a development that happened in the last week. Yeah. Um, so he's taking over what was Claire White in my oh. research. Yeah, we have just um, had a meeting with Jenny Wilson, um, who is going to um, fill as much of Matt's current role as she can. So Jenny Wilson will be. Oh, our Jenny Wilson? Our Jenny Wilson. Really? She's back? She's, well, she's not back. We, we're going to employ her on a casual rate to basically support everybody who's putting in grants for the next round. Oh, so. Excellent. She's great. And yeah. then Matt will be kind of... I'll be interested in the two and all the yeah. input into the CCJ and GCI application. Are you well. taking Claire's role? Yes. Yeah. You are? Yeah. Wow. Temporary. That's Temporary. Yeah. Hmm? Temporarily, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. Right, right. <laughs> Not be <him>. yeah. <laughs> It's a wild time, those two months. Yeah. A wild time in the research busy. office. Yeah. 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 Come back and tell us how it really works in time. Well, it should be good. I'll make some network and contacts over right. there and get yeah. a better perspective on how the whole sort of mm. process works. Mm. Mm. So I think it would be quite mm. beneficial. Okay, thank you, Matt. And Hennessy. Hi, uh, hey, Laura. Hennessy Hayes, uh, Criminology, good lecture in the school. Um, so, I. Yeah, so we're about to commence a pilot study, Martin Powell and Pam Snow at Latrobe and I, um, that we're hoping will inform what's the goal to inform a much larger linkage project. 
if we've pitched it as a discovery twice before, and it's competitive, it really is much more of a bona fide project. Right. Um, to help the department develop much better intake processes um, for young people and victims going through youth justice conference processes here in the state. Okay. So, and what would be Martine's role in that? Yes, yeah, so it's with the like, she and Pam have collaborated quite a lot in New South Wales and Victoria looking at language deficits of young people in detention and correctional settings. And so now we'll be able to have comparable data in kids in youth justice settings, which is a much more conversation or world demanding intervention than you know, youth court. <laughs> so um, and they've found in those two jurisdictions about half of those kids in detention have clinically significant but undiagnosed language deficits mm. that just really made things a lot worse in terms of their interactions with justice officials who just didn't go well in a lot of things. So yeah, that's the so I mean, so I'm hoping, Kathy, that you can tell me exactly how to get that. With I really, that. I do have a formula. Yeah. I definitely have a formula. The question is, can you do it? Yeah. Can yeah. do you do it? Do yeah. you have the mental and physical strength, fortitude, and perseverance to do it. Okay. <laughs> That's all it requires. But I at least for myself my formula has worked and I have a few little tips that might um, I mean but a lot of it is just the uh, we might want to close that door in a moment. So thanks Master Master when you come back so you can then introduce yourself. Uh, but if I've, I've been thinking about all of what I do uh, in getting grants, and this is exactly what I am relaying to you all, okay? This is exactly what I'm relaying, and also what I've done as an assessor. So here's Masahiro. He's a PhD student, has at least, what, 10 articles yeah. now? How many do you have? Uh, I think the only Yeah, he's getting his track record yeah. developed. So and why are you here today and what do you hope to learn? Yeah, so I'm a CCJ PhD student, so obviously I'm not writing for the LC grant, but I'm here to learn how to write a successful grant application for my future career. So right. Mark yeah. has also been successful so far in receiving, you received two scholarships from Japan, haven't you? Yes, so far, yes. Two scholarships. Uh, there is, a, uh, I think, there's a relationship between whether people, gra as graduate students, win awards and whether they go on to win them. So you have a good start in thinking about how to write uh, successful applications. It's not an absolute prediction, but there is some relationship there. I think talking with people over the years. All right. So um, some of you are on to particular projects, and others of you are just uh, osmosing possibilities for the future. And what I want to say about uh, those on specific projects is that you all need um, specific advice for your project. All I can offer today is general advice, uh, and that's about how to think about the, the proposal writing process itself. Uh, the Einstatter um, one, well, two-pager back-to-back is quite useful. Well. It's useful in the sense that it gives general advice. I read this article after I prepared my remarks some years ago. I mean, I'm using similar remarks as I've used in previous years. And she's saying all the things that I will say. Uh, or I, had, I said even before she published this article, let me reinforce. That is to say we all say the same thing. Um, and there is a standard set of ideas out there. You must just take those on board. What I'm going to be talking about today is something that people often don't also relay, which is how to think about the process. What's going on in your mind? Uh, what do you think about in terms of yourself and your own intellectual direction and capacity? This is often not discussed in these proposals. This is often uh, these proposal kind of tips uh, that you see written up. They're good tips but I want to dig deeper into what I would consider, consider to be the cognitive process in uh, thinking about writing a successful grant. So um, I want to give a story from last, last time I gave this about a month ago in the law school. There were, um, 
a guy kept uh, chimed in from the Gold Coast, although I couldn't see him like I can you, Laura. Um, and he said he wanted to know how things worked on the inside. Um, and uh, he meant by that on the inside of the ARC decision-making process. Now, he had a similar experience at Lee. That is, things did not work out well. He had reviewed proposals that he thought were great and they didn't get up. He had put in proposals and they didn't get up. So he figured there was something nefarious and kind of problematic going on in the bowels of the ARC. And it was this that he wanted to learn from me, how it was all working on the inside. And I said, no, Charles, I'm talking about the inside of your brain. That's what we're talking about today. And that's often not discussed in these tips. So now we have a new person here. And I, I've met you, but I'm forgetting your name. Tell me again. I'm Katie Gilder. Yeah, oh, Katie. Right. Okay. Now, Katie, we went around the room and introduced each other, and I asked people to say why are you um, here today in the sense of what you hope to learn or to contribute, and what are you planning to do? Can you just summarize that for us? We've just gone around the room and done that. Um, I'm here because I'd like to learn more about um, ARC. The ARC generally. Um, I've applied for grants from NIH and the states, but I don't know my mind about um, how it compares to the ARC process. And in terms of what I'm looking at, probably building on and adapting the, uh, the professional grant I just received, which is, is a data link that's looking at mortality by occupation mm -hmm. um, among sex workers in Australia. Did you get the NIJ grant in the US? We did not. And uh, hard to NIH, get. NIH, not NIJ, but yeah. Oh, NIH. They're still hard to get. They are very hard. Very hard <laughs> to get. But at least you put one in yeah. so you know what the experience is like. Okay, so you're in what I would call the osmosing kind of category as compared okay. to I have to write a grant in the next two months. Anyway, so um, I have this idea to start in terms of the handout, go through a series of things for you to reflect on, on yourself and where you're at. You have to ask yourself first what motivates, if you're about to write a proposal, what motivates you to do so? And even thinking about this in the future, what motivates you in the next two or three years, for that matter? If you're not sure what motivates you, or you're not fully motivated, I'd say don't do it. Think about that. Think about that. Many people have said over the years what motivates them is passion. My view is that you don't need money to fulfill a passion. You can do that in many different ways. Um, it's actually a, a flat-footed answer to say passion, in my view, because you really need to think of deeper emotions than that. I mean, you need passion to think about what you're writing about. You need to show you're interested in a topic. It's not that. It really is what are the emotions that really motivate you to write a grant. Now, I used to go around the room and ask people, and I found this was just, a, just too hard to get an answer. So I'll just tell you what motivates me, and then we can go on from there. Uh, I have three motivators. Um, one is fear. Now, fear, I was queried about this a month or so ago. Why would fear be a motivation? Well, it is a motivation. I have to also say, to cooperate, Lorraine Masrell also says that's a motivation for her, and she's been quite successful. The fear is a source of motivation because um, I don't want to not get it. I don't want to lose. But I'm fearful that I will. So the fear becomes this driving force to not lose. because. But it's fear of, of, of any kind of thing that you, it, it's an unknown. It's a sense that I have to kind of conquer the unknown. So of course you'd be fearful. Uh, and I think um, it does help me throughout the process uh, to keep me going. That's one. It's not the only one. The second is obligation. I feel I need to kind of bring money in to support uh, people and to advance the status of the university. And remembering, ARCs are not about money for the university. They're about status, especially when we're talking about the social sciences. We are such a drop in the bucket. I mean, and we're talking about a drop in a very tiny bucket as well. Um, in fact, it has been said that we should just do random random uh, allocation of grants rather than going through the expensive process of review. Because so little money, little money is given in the social sciences, we're wasting a huge amount of money in this competitive process. This has been actually documented, which is interesting. 
So uh, obligation, um, and we still are in a competitive process. I don't think any time soon we'll have a random, a random allocation of grant money. I think it would go against the kind of meritocratic ideal. And the final uh, thing, the final emotion uh, that keeps me going every day uh, is freedom. Um, that is, in the old days when I could get an ARC and buy out teaching, but of course now we have the new version with Decker and Future Fellowships, which are great, it was the idea of getting serious release time from teaching. Uh, that was great because when you're a lecturer and you're teaching and doing research, it is crazy. It is really crazy. For those of you now on research fellowships don't know how difficult it is. Uh, you have, in my view, a very easy ride. And when I say that, you're not dealing with the kind of the difficulties of having to move between the teaching and the research dimension. It's not easy, on the other hand, because you have a short-lived experience. You don't know where your next job is going to be, so that's constantly making you feel nervous. Uh, but really, your best next job is to get a lecturer job just so you can be settled somewhere, but that will bring with it, probably, not to take away from the fact of wanting to get a DECRA now, but um, it comes with you, it comes with it at least a, a stability that you know you can be here for a little while, look around, and look for grants, where if you're in a research fellowship, every two years you're looking for your next job. Very hard, it has a lot of freedom, but it has that cost. So uh, wherever you are, it's not easy, really, but from the perspective of doing research, take all you can from your research years, um, because when you're combining research and teaching, it's hard, it's very hard. I remember those days well, I did it for 35 years, and now I don't to do it anymore, but I think I put my time in the salt mine now that I can, you know, not worry about it. So I like that. All right, so a couple of visualization uh, things next. This is the end point that you have to have in mind, and I'll get you, I'll, then we'll go back to the start. But the end point is, I want you to visualize a pile of uh, ARC proposals. Yours is in that pile. Imagine a pile of 50, uh, and it's on an assessor's desk or on a College of Experts desk. Um, what is going to make your proposal stand out? What's going to make it possible for your proposal not to be flicked away? What are you going to do to make sure you stay in the in pile? So in that in pile, roughly on uh, current percents is that you need to be, uh, you need to be ten, ten, maybe nine, you need, need, nine proposals will stay in roughly, let's say roughly, and that's probably a um, generous um, estimate. Also visualize the fact that in that pile are many, many excellent proposals, many excellent proposals. Some are very, very good. And I will tell you later, don't use very in any of your writing, please. We'll say why adverbs are useless in most of your writing. So, but I will say very and actually, just because I don't know what to do when I'm talking to a group, but, but don't do it in your writing. So you need to figure out how your proposal is going to stand out. And uh, there's a very simple rule I use uh, which is you really have to be on the side of your assessor. You really have to think of your assessor and look at it this way. I've heard this to be the case. It's not the case with me when I read proposals, that the assessors um, are in their bed, you know, kind of flicking through their pile of proposals and throwing them off, you know. They are reviewing a lot of proposals very quickly. They are not reading your proposal word for word. Don't even assume that. They're probably reading the first page and tossing it. That would be my assumption. Not until I get on the College of Experts will I know that, and I'm hopeful to do that one day very soon. Uh, but they have to make a lot of decisions rapidly for a large number of proposals, and that includes, and quite importantly, who the proposal is going to go to for review. That's a very important role. Mm -hmm. Can I just check if people are clear on how you have like a carriage person within the College of Experts and then it's sent out to external reviewers as well? Is that that? Why don't you just explain that because this doesn't always stay the same. 
Yeah, this, this changes over time. Okay. Like, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so your proposal goes into the ARC. Um, the project title, the A4 summary, the A5 summary, and your FO, FOR and SEO codes all sort of fit into this <coughs> matrix that spits out some keywords. That then, the system then matches that with other people's RMS accounts. So these are people that have got ARC grants usually, or they've signed up to be an ARC assessor. Um, sort of matches with those accounts based on their expertise text and their FOR codes that are in their proposals. Um, and then someone, usually uh, on the College of Experts, um, depends on the scheme, sometimes they have different requirements, but for Discovery Projects and DECRA, usually you've got some College of Experts members, one or two of them will sit down and look at these matches and assign your proposal to these expert reviewers. We'll go out to them, usually four, five people. They'll comment on the proposal, um, Set some scores, you won't be able to see those scores, but they'll put in a whole series of comments. Um, and that'll come back in, you'll then get a chance to respond to those comments, but you can't see any of the scores, you just see what they've said. Um, and then Could you just repeat that part? What do you not see and what do you see? So you see their comments on your proposal. So they'll list a series of comments under the selection criteria. You're talking about the, what the when feedback you get. I, was talking, I, was, I know details, that part. So I was looking about the inside. What happens, yeah. Yeah. And then That'll go in, you provide a response which goes into the system as well. And that becomes visible to your College of Experts members. They call them Carriage 1 and Carriage 2. So there's two people that are assigned to review your proposal. And those people usually have up to you know 200 proposals right. to review a Sorry, so there are two people on the College of Experts that get your. Yeah. I thought there was only one. So Carriage okay. 1 it will have sort of primary responsibility yeah, okay. for it. But yeah, both I Carriage not 1 and Things the, change. Yeah. Things do yeah. change. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, but they'll also score your proposal. You don't get a chance to respond to any of their comments. Um, they'll score the proposal. Uh, they'll have to score your assessor scores as well, and it also feeds into the final score. And, and their the weight is heavier than the actual reviewers that you know what they score. Mm -hmm. If you well, it's, they are like the individual scores yeah. are weighted higher because your college scores are worth fifty percent, and detailed scores are worth fifty percent. But obviously, you can have you know, six. So they, this is the gets to the pile. There's 200 they're looking at. Oh, That's yeah. well, how are you going to stand out in that 200? What are you going to do to be special? And as I keep saying, you um, are in good company. There are very good people out there in our in our work and uh, they're getting better and better. So you're in some pretty stiff competition. And you have to be able to help them sell the proposal to others because they all get together much like this. They sit around a big square table that's called the Vectors Managers, each different discipline panel, um, and they'll go through the top, you know, whatever it is, they'll find out where the funding line's going to be based on how much money there is. The ones that are right at the top, they'll sort of just flip through them quickly and go, yep, we approved this. And then there's usually 10 or 20 that are on that funding line, yeah. uh, and I'll discuss them in quite a bit of detail. Yeah. They need to talk about. Can I ask? I remember um, we had a woman come up from Canberra. Um, I can't remember what her position was, but she was explaining a lot of the a lot of this, and she showed a graph that she wasn't able to distribute to us, um, but it showed that probably 90 percent, or maybe it was 80, of the the funds go to group of eight universities. And, it, and I don't know if that's just an accidental outcome or if it's like a target for the ARC. Because I think 10% was going to others like Griffith, QT, um, Bond. It, it's probably close. I can get the figures. They're all public. They're all public. I think so it's can, the target. I it think definitely what the target. Yeah. Yeah. It's just because, yeah. It's worth, cause the, because that's 25% of the weighting, isn't it, the institution? Um, uh, it's it's different now, so they've changed the selection criteria for Discovery Project and for DECRA, so okay. they don't have the research environment as a separate selection criteria anymore. Oh, right. It's built into, well, it's split across actually three different selection criteria that it's into now. So you've really got to factor your research environment into your project description and talk about oh, how right. many projects supported directly by the research environment. Mm -hmm. I think that should be overarching. Mm -hmm. One of the things is that, and this is really important, the, the, the criteria, the rules, what you have to do, they keep changing every Absolutely. year. Yeah. And so whatever I did last time is probably not, ex Sorry. in a specific way, not relevant, but in a general way, I think things still, that I'm about to say, are still relevant. 
and they keep the same people on the college for three years at a time. So those people sort of have that perspective over multiple years. They still assess the proposals in a similar way, I would suspect. And can I ask, sorry, just with, with track record, which I recall once was 40% of the way you make is it the track record of individual team? It, it, sorry, is it the track record of the team mm -hmm. if you've got more than one, or the track record of the they look at each one? It has separately. to be the team. You're only given one yeah. score. I mean, fellowship or a step brief, then you've got one person, right. but it's all the CIs and PIs. Right. Um, obviously, your lead CI is going to play a, probably a bigger role in that score. They're going to look at that much more right. carefully, I would suspect. Different assessors probably do different things there, but yeah, it is the team. You I have think. to be my. Thought, but you'd be closer to it, perhaps, Matter Susan. You might have got other advice. That I mean, I've had to assess teams. I find it difficult. It mm -hmm. really is coherence, and whether they all, whether they combine to form something that I yeah. think is an excellent kind of combination of skill versus being not ragtag, but not necessarily yeah. coherent. Yeah, and you see people putting on, you know, that senior professors. It really has nothing to do with the project, mm -hmm. but they're just trying to grab that track record and yeah. it's, 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 it's And you can right smell that right away, and it just it's not going to help. It's not yeah. going to help. They need another role. And there's, a, there's something about a new rule about having to publish with people. Well, as well. now they're looking at that track record, particularly in how you've worked together previously. Mm -hmm. So have you published together? Mm -hmm. Have you developed methodology together? All of those sorts of things. How are your institutions working together to some degree? You know, right. If you can show that there's a good connection there. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's all important. Yeah. Yeah. It's not just that you all have the expertise anymore. You have to put right. some history together. Otherwise, they think you might come together and it's just not going to work. Yeah. yeah. Um, can I ask Matt, when they're sitting around the table and they're talking about why one proposal should be funded over another, what are the kind of words that you hear being said? Uh, it really depends on the proposal. Um, yeah, they'll they'll go through, so they'll look at the selection criteria and they'll, they'll take it back to the individual points. So you can see, like, they'll have all the scores up on the screen. Mm -hmm. They'll be able to see that. And so mm -hmm. usually there's one area where they've sort of fallen down a little bit that's just brought it into that bracket. Mm -hmm. So the discussion's really going to focus on that. Um, and this, and what are the scores are, do they all add up to 100? So they're looking at scores from 100 down to 50? Or what are the, what's the metric that they're looking to uh, score? It'll depend on the panel. Uh, so the difference of the SBE, which is Social, Behavioral, and Economic Sciences, I think they have about 700 proposals in their panel. Right. So they all get sort of ranked based on scores. Uh, and then before they actually start going through that process of talking about each one, they'll just go around the room and ask, people to you know look at that list and decide or uh, just identify proposals but this is carriage one and carriage two identifying them um, that are in the top that need to be brought down for discussion or something that might have fallen down to the bottom that that carriage member thinks needs to be taken up into that discussion bending. Um, they sort of sort that out fairly quickly and then they go through that top list and basically tick them off and fund them at the bottom of the list and go yeah we're not really going to yeah. fund them but I find it difficult because if you look at just the discovery criteria, I don't think this is four now that you have to score. I remember project, track record, it used to be environment, and then, I don't know, impact, whatever it is. Uh, investigators, yeah, your project quality and innovation, feasibility, yeah. and benefit. Right. So, and, and there's, you, you only can give four marks, A, B, C, D, in that. And I would think there'd be a lot of clumping with a lot of A's and you know, A's and B's and so be a lot of clumping with the based college on members, their scores, because they've got, you know, 100 or up to 200 proposals that they're looking at. They'll normalize their scores and put them over a distribution. Yeah, but still, I mean, if they're all getting the same, even a distribution, there'd be clumps that with the identical. So yeah. I, would, I would find it hard to know how they would figure that out. Um, but, Kathy, I think your um, point is right, the one that you were making earlier about how you're going to make it stand out. Yeah. Because that first project summary is where they're getting their kind of keywords from for a start. And also, it's the first thing that you carry. So people are going to be looking at. And if you can't make them feel the excited, then it's not memorable for them to advocate on your behalf later on. Mm -hmm. And if they can't understand it too, yeah. that first yeah. bit, they'll assign it to the wrong people. Yeah. They'll overrule those um, yeah. matches all the time. And yeah, I, have a, I have a question. Yeah. Yeah, uh, please. So, so, there's a, so on the website, there's just a list, right, of the people on the College of Experts. Mm -hmm. uh, now, do we know at all who's on the SBE? No. 
panel. So, so I can spot, obviously I can spot two criminologists, right? They're most likely to be within ours. Who are they? Yeah. Who are they? Um, Sharon Pickering and um, Heather Douglas. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah. It's reasonable. You know, you can do a request not to accept. Yes. Yeah. 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 But when it's a college of experts, you need to include one. Yeah, you need no. a PC sign. Yeah. 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 Um, and Sharon's on SBE, Heather's on HCA. She's on the law. I would assume Heather would be on the law. So okay. I knew. Okay, maybe she's in law. So oh, she is law. She's she a law professor, yeah, 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 but yeah. she does law socially. I just kind of because that's the only one that. Mm -hmm. uh, sure, she would be an obvious person in your area mm -hmm. in terms of DV, even exactly. more than Sharon. Exactly. Oh, the issue. So they changed. They changed the panels. So linkage projects, I think, operate on the whole panel basis, whereas discovery and DECRA have five different panels. They actually changed the names of panels. Okay. Um, so yeah, it can vary quite a lot. Once, one time the ARC had set panels and you could see who was on what. Why, why can't you see that? I suppose they wanted more flexibility and being able to determine you know, who is assigned, assigned to what. Possibly the linkage going continuous, they need to be able to pull people. Because obviously not all of the assessments do all of the projects. And do, you, do they also not want you to, in a way, write it to oh. the... Yeah, probably. As to the College of Experts. But keep in mind too, if you've ever published with anyone, uh, yeah. so published with people who are two years, I think it is, or if you've got any other collaborators from Griffith or universities that you've worked at previously, those people will not be the college right. yeah. members, they won't be your detailed person. So Heather was at Griffith previously. Yeah. Uh, what's the time frame? I think that's two or three years as well. Mm, she's been here. She's been gone for a while. Yeah, at least five years. So you cannot find out at all, the sorry, what does it live there? No. Okay. No. I mean, you can infer and you can you okay. can probably make an educated okay. guess about all the people, but yeah. And it well, somebody like, somebody like Heather, I, I don't know. I, uh, yeah. I don't know either. Uh, yeah. can, can I just say, we can, we can ruminate on the big, bad, dirty, ugly ARC assessment process. I want to get back into your yeah. brain because you can constantly deflect deflect on that you do want to know what goes on the inside like like charles charles is my friend from a month ago who's talking from the gold coast but ultimately i would argue you need to figure out what's going on in your brain that is much more important than wondering who is on the arc panel forget who's on the panel forget who's on the panel you have to write a proposal that's going to stand out whoever reads it whoever yeah. reads it so don't don't let that that concern that I'm going to be badly treated even creep into your head. Yeah. Be fearful of other things instead, which is, is that someone doesn't really know this field very well, uh, that I really don't know what I'm going to be doing. That's what you need to be most fearful about, not about who's going to do the assessing, because my experience is that around the room, the top 10% or 15% of anything is there's consensus. We pretty much all agree, even if we're in completely different fields. And that what, that's what comes out of a lot of experiences of doing assessment. Uh, and, and so I would say just put that out of your mind uh, if you can. Although I have done this year, I did apply, I did put in an SBE field of research code because I thought, well, I have a better chance. The only criminologist last year, when I, two years ago when I applied, and I normally go in at HCA because criminology doesn't have justice in its, in its code. And I do justice. It's a big mistake that Ross Hummel, whoever made, in creating the criminology code. There's no justice in criminology. So you have a comment. Yeah, no, I was just going to say don't try and play the code too much. You know, you're yes. talking about do, trying mm -hmm. psych or something like that. I mean, you risk, you know, unless it's a squarely psych yeah. Yeah. proposal that's using solid psych methods and all of that sort of thing, you're going to end up with people which, critiquing it because yeah. it doesn't look like a psych yeah. proposal. So which, it, which it could it could actually go that way as well. And we yeah. have, like, we have old law award as well. Mm -hmm. kind of, you know, yeah, ranging time. Yeah, yeah. So we, yeah. I think you once you've got it, yeah. Then I think you go with what the project actually yeah. looks like because you can yeah. try and play the game. But and it's not going to work. It's a roll of the dice. So I, I think you know, I went under criminology, yeah. squarely under criminology, because it was nothing other than a criminology yeah. project. Yeah. And you know, it was it got through. I mean, 
do you request not to assess and all of that? Yeah, if there's key people that you really want to speak with you and yeah. so yeah, put it under the code that fits. Yeah, okay. So you have to be focusing on writing the very, very best proposal. Yeah. The very and writing what does that mean is I'll get to it means um, having a an excellent idea, an excellent execution of an idea, and what I'm trying to develop now, who you are as a researcher. That is really important. That is really important. And that's the next, well, I want to I mention something because this a show is on uh, TV tonight. Do any of you ever see Hard Quiz? I find the most entertaining show I've seen on television in a long time. It's Tom Gleason has these different uh, people come in that have expertise in different areas like Snow White and Seven Dwarfs or who knows, I mean it's these uh, so quite detailed little expertise areas and he asks them a lot of questions. There's a lot of questions about their areas of knowledge as well as kind of general knowledge. And the process works through a process of elimination where someone doesn't kind of remain because they don't have enough points. And so he goes, ow! <coughs> And I, I used to say Chuck, but now I have out. You don't want your proposal to get in the Gleason out. And I do recommend, if it's, I think it's still on tonight, 8 o'clock on ABC. It's a funny, funny show. Watch it to know that you don't want to get Tom Gleason out. <laughs> All right, so um, the next reflection is, and this is actually quite importantly, I think it's quite important for you in terms of some of the difficulties you're facing, but anyone who's a DECRA scholar as well, um, and that is you need to look at yourself from a distance and ask, what do I have to offer? What is my unique and important contribution? What do I care about? That actually is never, I keep saying actually, Mary, please ignore the, the use of these adverbs in, in your writing. Um, this is not put in how to think about writing grants, but it is so important. You need to look at yourself, not in a harsh way, but in a constructive way. And you need to say, what do I do well? What do I not do well? What's special about the work that I do? So you really need to, really, you need to develop an identity um, uh, of yourself as an intellectual. Um, the ultimately, then, you need to know yourself. Now, that is an important rule of thumb for virtually everything you do as a researcher. Whether you're writing a proposal, writing your, an article, or even doing a presentation, you need to know yourself. What do you stand for? What's your professional identity? What do you want to be known for? If you don't have that figured out very well, the assessor won't either. And the assessor wants to know that. They want to know what they are buying. And remember, this is taxpayer money that's buying an idea and an excellent execution of the idea. So you, you're, you're selling something that will be bought. Now, what is it that's being bought? Well, it's, it's an aesthetic, isn't it? It's something that's hard to describe. It's something called excellent, excitement important, the right person, the great idea. So you you have to get that part of the person in the, in the story right. And as I say later, it's the combination of the good idea and the person doing it that's important. If the people aren't right, it's not going to fly. If the idea is a bit off, not going to fly. You need to show how each is going to work with the other. And you need to think about doing this. this is another kind of reinforcement from Lorraine Maserell. From page one to page end at the end. And every page has to keep beaming out person and project in a consistent way. If you start falling down, if you start being inconsistent, if you start, if, if you do anything that's kind of falling out of line, from this general quest for, dare I say, perfection, it's, it's likely to be weakened. So just keep, keep a consistent message about the team and the project, or yourself and the project. Uh, that is important. Uh, I would also, too, and I'm not sure whether you want to look back, but it may be useful, Susan, you might have ideas on this. This has never happened to me, so I'm sorry, but it hasn't really happened to me. Uh, negative assessor reports and, and not getting funded. Um, although I did once for a, a laureate. I, I can't remember if I even got assessor reports for that. I can't even remember. 
But um, the uh, I'm not sure whether you would recommend this, Susan. Uh, but for those who got try to get proposals up and they didn't get them, how much the comments from assessors from previous years uh, are could be of some use. You got yours up this last time after getting a. Uh, not not getting it right. You mean the discovery? The discovery. Uh, so it's, it, it, we didn't get it twice. So now twice, we, right? Did you use your past comments? Oh, yeah, sorry, yeah, I interrupted. Yeah, yeah. It's just that it's, it it really is a leakage, and we shouldn't have gone there. Ah, it, I see. Yeah, yeah. Okay, all right. But so, so now we've got the CRG no. to do the pilot. And I think right. that's going to make a linkage stronger. Right. Right. So you're yeah. packaging it more as a linkage than as a discovery. Yeah. I mean, you might have a look at those comments. I would say at this point now they're they're done and dusted because you're on to already writing the draft. But if you begin to see something creeping up, like the team doesn't seem to be the right team, if that's coming up along, I'd be looking at your team uh, or the idea. Oh, that was all yesterday. We have that's already been done, and that keeps coming up. I'd be looking at that because uh, I find. Even if you're really annoyed with the reviewers, sometimes they do have little gems of insight. Even if you, even if you don't want to hear them, yeah, they I do have somebody gems. off the team from the first um, application for the recent discovery to the resubmitting it um, because although we're in the top 10% of unsuccessful, um, probably the harshest comments came around the team. Yeah. Um, and it was pretty solid, but there are a few, and there was one person that was weaker, and they, right. there were comments made about that person. And, yeah. you know, I really like the person, but if we're not going to get the grant, then it's no help to anybody. Yeah. So I was ruthless and took the person off for the person. So, you did and everything else comment. was tweaking and just, yeah. you know, making sure that it was completely airtight. That, yeah. You know, there yeah. was there weren't many comments that we really had to address, but I just, I still, like, in the resubmission, did another eight versions of that grant. Like, you know, it was just, you know, as polished as it could possibly be. Only eight. So I do at least on, on the resubmission. Oh, the first okay. one had, like, 20. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yeah. At least. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Kind of Powering forward quickly, I, I love the conversation, but I have to say, I don't have to talk about all the points, but I do want to get to a few. On the time to write, I won't go through this in any great detail, but you do need some good running room there. Ingrid says two months, it takes a lot more to get your ideas in shape and talk with people, and in our field, certainly, although she's in, she wrote this for nature, and I think she's a biological scientist at some level. Anyway, so uh, the the idea really is to make sure you've lined up the relevant actors that you need to rely upon, the data that you need to rely upon. All of that is crucial to developing a proposal that's concrete. And the plan must be concrete. And I'll tell you more about how to make a concrete plan. So, uh, so you need time, definitely. And of course, is it uh, time to apply. Don't apply if you prefer to just get a few publications. Certainly track record um, can matter a great deal and if it's not strong enough you shouldn't go forward. Um, you're wasting your precious time uh, when you could be writing an article unless you're, you know, your back's to the wall and you have no time left in terms of eligibility. All right, so we talked a little bit about you, and I won't be forgetting you because we'll keep getting back. It's all about what's going on in your mind. But I want to say something about what's going on in the assessor's mind next. So we're moving on to item B. Uh, in doing one of these workshops before uh, several years ago, uh, uh, this guy and I were presenting ideas, and one of the things that he said was, you need to write a grant proposal as if you are the assessor. Now that's an interesting thought, isn't it? Um, it's important that you do this uh, because it becomes a kind of critical frame of reference for yourself. Uh, every time, you can't kind of do it all the time because if you're constantly thinking that assessors looking over your shoulder, you'll be frozen at the, uh, at the computer screen. Although, um, I would argue don't start with your computer as a way to get at your idea and I'll tell you what I do and I think it's quite successful. So what an assessor wants is a good idea and an ex excellent execution of a good idea. Now on the idea, 
it really has to be a good idea, a simple but captivating idea. That isn't necessarily easy, but, you, that, but with revisions you'll get there. That takes a little while to figure out what it is that it will be. Uh, in fact, you probably may not know what the idea is until you've finished writing the proposal at the very end. Be prepared for that. You might start with one idea, but you might end up with a slightly different one. So be, be, um, be ready to be flexible, but at the same time you have to persevere. Uh, the, the beginning start of the process is very hard. Um, the ASR review, the American Sociological Review article, looks at how assessors make judgments uh, of proposals. And one of the things that they say is that they make a judgment based on what they call the intellectual authenticity of the researcher. Now, um, this gets us back to the problem of, of you, again, because the idea cannot be separated from who you are. So some of the words that they use to talk about proposals that were not intellectually authentic were these. These are the words, these, these are the negative words. Conformist, pedestrian, fashionable, trendy, throwing around buzzwords. Don't do this. Write the proposal to a general audience. Write it in plain, simple English. Use short words. When a shorter word is better than a longer word, use the shorter word. I always find that kind of restriction on word length helpful because I have to get rid of two lines. Guess what? It makes the proposal better because it's less wordy. Um, so, uh, so you need to think back to yourself in terms of that question of being intellectually authentic about what your scholarly identity is and so forth. Now, how do you get started on this? This all seems a bit overwhelming. It is overwhelming at the start. I always remember the start of writing proposals. Actually, I don't want to remember it now because it just kind of brings back such discomfort. How do I get confident in thinking about my idea? What do I do? I say this, the best thing you can do is not start at a computer screen, but start with speaking to an audience of people with your tape recorder on and you're giving them your pitch. They're all there, ready to kind of be applaud you for your idea. Uh, you have that support. Everything, everything in human existence is social. Everything is. So your relationship to the assessor, your imaginary assessor, is one in which you're talking to a group and you're trying to persuade that group. But you have that group have in your mind someone who's already ready to accept. So you're not already, you're not having to persuade a harsh group. Um, you need that sense of confidence in the early days to get some degree of lift off. But I can tell you that my first and second drafts are just rotten. They're terrible. They're awful. They are really bad. And I feel so badly for those that I sent them around for review. I think, how embarrassing. How terrible. Uh, and they usually, the, the kiss of death is someone who reviews your proposal and says, oh, this is great. I don't see anything to change. You're like, well, I'm not going to ask that person to review anymore. Well, it's good to get someone who says that, but that's not what you want. You want someone who says, I'm not going to work. This part's good. This part's not working. Uh, so, uh, he, this is the very, very hard part of the process where you're working through the idea, you've gotten a few people feedback saying, I don't think this is very good. Uh, get a few of those, very helpful to structure and to think about, especially those from people you um, respect. I have a tip here that I want to give you uh, just in terms of thinking about those early days. The early days, as now I'm thinking of a discovery as compared to a DECRA or, or a linkage. But you know they all have these sections. Well, I get a filing tub, you know, with those things, that you, with, your, with the hanging files. And I have each section, A and B, C, D and E. In each section, it has material that I'll be analyzing, and I slot things in there, along with, of course, your exemplar proposals, and you'll get some of those. Now, why is that important? 
how many people can chime in and let me know how often they've lost pieces of paper in writing their proposal. How many, but I just put that down. Where is it? Where is it? <laughs> well, you have your file box. Everything is ordered in that way. And particularly when you're doing the track record sections, which you can do in your off time, although they have to be also excellent. But it's not like you have to think about the project. You can be doing other important work. And that work um, on the track record part also needs to be absolutely spotless and fantastic and without error and without any error at all and consistent. Uh, do not be sloppy in your in your uh, in, in any way at all, but particularly in the style you use. When I get sloppy proposals, out, just out. I a sloppy proposal doesn't care. Why should I give money to this person? Why should I give any money to this person who doesn't respect? that they have to write a proposal that's as good as somebody else's who did care. Now, it's a bit harsh. Maybe it was a great idea. Maybe it was a great team. But if they can't execute it, then why should they be funded? What's their final research product going to look like? The judgments are being made uh, of that nature as well. So just be aware of that. Just don't let and don't, don't have any weakness at all in that respect. So, and back to consistency here, and that's part of the whole kind of you know stuff you worry about at the end. When I didn't worry about just at the end, but when you're revising and revising and reading through and so forth. What I want to say about the idea is that you'll begin to develop more confidence as you can continue to write and rewrite and rewrite, and you'll come up with uh, ideas along the way for how to structure it. Uh, and the more you can cut out and kind of get to the bare bones of it, the better. But it takes a while to get there. Now, I know Ross Hummel was supposed to be here, and he wasn't, but it was Ross who made this comment to me at the end of submitting a proposal uh, after I had submitted it, and he said, what was your epiphany? Well, what he's saying there is that, um, I've indicated this already, but once you finish the proposal, you've come, actually, you've come to understand something you didn't understand until you wrote the proposal. And so what you set out to do at the start may at the end turn out to be something different at the end, or certainly you've learned something in the writing of it. Um, on the one hand, in the writing of the proposal, particularly, I think, the, um, the project, but again, don't fall down on the track record or any other part, particularly the budget justification. Oh, people don't like it when you don't have a good budget justification. I've seen plenty of that conversation, uh, certainly just in internal grants here in this university. Uh, um, everything really has to be done well. People will, will glom into certain things. I, I suspect that there are certain areas that people are quite you know, they go into that as a kind of indication of somebody's moral character if they haven't done that correctly. Um, so you have to persevere uh, uh, and, and keep working and working, climbing that tall mountain uh, to get that project uh, good. But you need to be flexible and think about ways it can, it can always be better. One of the areas here that you need to think about in your project design which I'll get to uh, very soon, is um, the problem of constraints. We can't have the data we would really want. We don't have all the data we would like. It may be hard to get the data uh, that would be optimal. You need to look at those constraints as opportunities. In fact, you need to turn those constraints into something that's creative as an opportunity in terms of what you're, you're going to do. And remember ultimately that what you're writing is a research project that is plausible. It may not be that you'll be able to do all the things that you set out doing, but it needs to be plausible. And it is good when your project, when you when you do get the project and you're working on it, that you're actually doing what you said you planned to do. But sometimes it doesn't necessarily work out that way. And when you're writing your project design uh, part, there will be places where you need to talk about the fact that there are contingencies. You don't know what's going to happen in year three. You might as well just fess up and say, I'm not sure what's going to happen in year three, but if 
the like assuming that this happens that we'll to do this and then we'll do that you want to help the reader fund you so and if they see a weakness and say well what are they going to do in your it's not clear well it may not be possible to be clear now in, a, in, a, in an intellectually rigorous way so better to admit to that and uh, uh, to, to sort of be honest about what's, what you can say, but ultimately re remember all you need is plausibility. It fits together, it seems to make sense, the pieces go right, and of course it should be the, proposed, the work that you plan to do. It shouldn't be so off base. But sometimes things do change, and that does happen. I mean, I really changed my previous ARC drastically, but no one said anything. I just did it, and so I did it. Okay, so we have the good idea. Any questions before I move on the project, on the idea of thinking about good ideas? Is this where you're, this is where Christian's struggling right now? Is where you're struggling? You have a good idea? We have a good idea. You do? Is it fantastic? It's going to stay on the pile? If we, uh, the idea is good. It depends on how we how we sell it. How you sell it? Yes. Okay. If we sell it well, then yes, it's going to be correct. Well. You have to think about this is yeah. a, a primarily it's a sales document. You have the right orientation. It is not a research document. It's a sales document. Mm -hmm. Remember that. Remember that all the time. Is this worth taxpayer money? Is this worth taxpayer money? This is yeah. See, you're getting very confident. <laughs> you're going to have to keep that confidence yeah. going. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Kristen, you just need to keep working through and working through, and then the light the light bulb will come out for you. But uh, look, it's uh, perseverance is uh, an important uh, quality, and what that means is. Get to the desk, be there all day, do not be interrupted at home, you know, lollygagging around the city, having fun. You have no fun running an ARC proposal. <laughs> the best thing you can do is no either do meditation, <laughs> meditation, yoga, or just television, or certainly exercise. Get plenty of exercise so you get good rest. And remember that a lot of your ideas are um, being circulated in your brain while you're sleeping. It's amazing what will happen when you wake up in the morning. Be attentive to what ideas come to you in the morning, or any time, really, for that matter. Uh, and that, uh, sometimes uh, when I was writing my book, it's no different, really, than writing the ARC grant. It was when I was riding my bicycle. Oh, I know what I'll do now. So sometimes it's getting away from it a little bit then you can begin to kind of see the situation uh, more clearly. And you just don't know what's going to happen, but just be attentive to the little pieces in the wind that are instructing you about what to do. What? Sorry? Can we love people in South? Because in the lab, there's no access to internet, no phone, <laughs> no electronics. You just sit in there and write. Yeah. Well, the best thing I would say is find the place where you are most productive, wherever that is. And make sure no one interrupts you with what's going on in their life. Uh, just let them know you have no time for them. Unless you see them later for a drink or dinner, then you can have fun. You need a little One break, <laughs> but you really, do you want to turn off your phone? Mm -hmm. You need to be very careful with how you, you know, how you work most productively. You need to have an excellent workspace uh, where you won't be distracted. You really need to think about it. I'm concerned with Kirsten that she's not going to have a distraction-free workplace. It's what I said to you. You need to find a good place and have, you <laughs> have, have your file box. You know, have all the tools, you know, so you don't lose pieces of paper. And that may happen uh, as Oh, well, you also are gathering pieces of paper that you'll that you'll use later, and you know they're there. But then you can go and look. I, I just found that really helpful. It always helps me. I wrote my book that way as well. I had a, a hanging file for each chapter. It was quite useful. 
quite useful. And then I had this chapter where I had to integrate kind of three different sets of literature. I had them all sitting in the same file. They didn't make any sense, but then I had to make sense of them because they were in that one file. They had to be in that one chapter. So it forces you to think uh, synthetically, I suppose. All right, the most important part of getting a good, of getting a grant, and we're almost, gee, my gosh, I better stop, is the ex excellent execution of a good idea. The most important thing, the most important thing you can do in your whole career is learn how to write brilliantly. It is over 60%, colleague and I have decided, is what gets you over the line. Excellent writing. Now, do all of you think you are excellent writers? This will be a problem. Find a good editor then. Mm -hmm. Find a good editor. Now, what do you have to be concerned about? Easy to read and follow. No one wants to read a sentence more than once. Does the proposal flow? Does it sparkle? That lovely Australian expression, she'll be right, will not get you over the line. She won't be right. <laughs> she won't be right. <laughs> it must be great. It must be great. Now, the only way that things ever get great is that you send it around to lots of different people for review. My last proposal, I went through three separate reviews interspersed by about two weeks or so. And uh, each one of them, I completely rewrote the project proposal. They didn't read the rest of the proposal, although I must say, don't fall down on those other parts. Don't fall down. They all need careful, careful attention. Um, and uh, you have to structure that in. You have your first round, those poor people who read the first round. It gets better with the second one. It's getting better, it's getting better. And then, I had this time a very strong third review that really that made a big difference for me. So, Kathy, when do you get to a point where you decide you nailed it? You know, yeah, I mean, yeah. after it on the deadline right. date. Right. <laughs> <laughs> By that time, I've done rereading, 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 checking for typos, checking for yeah. any types of errors. It's interesting that you should ask this question because Lorraine Maserell asked a similar question about what's your thought process. I don't know what my thought process is. I'm trying to give it to you as much as I can, which is that it's all hard and I don't count what I'm doing on which day and I don't remember anything of what I've done exactly. It's one of those things, the same thing when I wrote my book, I don't remember what I did. It was all a bit of a blur. And that's because I'm so inside of it. I'm so inside of it. Uh, but there'll be a point at which the, a reviewer on the th third review says, this is great, all you have to do is this, this, and this, and you feel you might have a chance. Uh, but ultimately, it will, oh, I go back maybe two weeks after I submitted and say, was this good enough? And I think, well, I think it might have been. But you're not really sure even when you submit that it's good enough. But you need to give yourself plenty of time to revise and make sure it's as good as you can make it. Now, on the research plan, uh, on the excellent writing, you must get strong and white. Um, the last, uh, this is an old text, 1959. Very cute. But read an approach yeah, to it's style. It's beautiful now. It's got little illustrations and stuff. Do you have the uh, the more the recent more version? Recent one, yeah. well, see, I like the old version. Yeah. I think the more recent version is too complicated. Although, it's, it's really, yeah, maybe it's not the right recent version. I remember looking at a more recent version, thinking that it was too cluttered. I just like the simplicity of the old version. Kathy, what's that called? Sorry. It, this is up on your resources. The URL that you see there. If you go up, it's all photocopied for you. Elements of style, strong and white. Um, oh, yes. This becomes, I take this down from my uh, shelf, and I get inspiration in terms of thinking about writing. And look, apart from the grammar, which you really, if you don't know grammar, you must learn grammar so you know um, what you're doing and what you shouldn't be doing, and even when, you know when you're even making mistakes quite explicitly, but you're doing that to make a point. 
So make have a look at an approach to style with a list of reminders at the end. It is it is good. It's it's a bit time based, you know. It's all in his and he and all of that stuff. So, you know, but the uh, write in a way that comes naturally. Write with nouns and verbs. Uh, revise and revise. Do not overwrite. Avoid the use of qualifiers. That's all your adverbs. Do not affect a breezy matter. Do not explain too much. This is just general writing. Be clear. Um, use figures of speech sparingly. I would say do not use any colloquial expressions like the one that I, I cringe every time I see it is uh, there's no there's no one size fits all. Use it, man. It is so trite. Trite. Do not use trite expressions. It's not it's not recommended. And then of course we have Helen Sword, a stylish academic writing, and she starts off with Strunk and White saying, Here, "There's a manual." And I thought, "Okay." okay. They are, they are my manual. But she says, they say, you know, use clear, precise language, do this, do that. And then she says, pick up a peer review journal, and what do you get? Just the opposite. So this is a useful book. It's a very useful, it's a useful book. Uh, uh, I don't know if it's in the library, but um, it helps you to think about your writing that, um, you might begin to r reduce some of the little nervous tics we all have. No. And on that, in terms of good writing, make sure that you get exemplar uh, AR, uh, ARC grants. Read plenty of those. Uh, some people read them and say, hmm, I didn't that again. Oh. Mine didn't, but anyway, don't know the answer to that. Um, are they are the ones that get funded? Are they on like a website or something, or do you keep a document? No, they're not. You have to ask people. Yeah. Uh, research have a like, yeah. library of grants, and they have a little process. You fill out a form saying that you're not going to you know, copy it and distribute it to You can do that. You can do that. that you can contact it. individuals. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you can. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And is that only successful <coughs> grants or any that have It'll been applied? Be, yeah, they've got. The main thing I learned from the exemplars is just to see what the various moves are. What's the introduction look like? How does it, how does the project get set up? I got an exemplar to see what I should do for management of research data, which is one of those new categories. What were people writing? Okay, well I'll just use that rough language. Um, I'm happy to I've, I'm happy to share any of my proposals, but uh, so if you want to look at mine, I'm happy to share. Can I add something about the writing? I would say that some days you have great writing days where the words flow mm -hmm. and it, it just comes out right, and other days you just can't. It's, it's like concrete; you just can't get it happening. And so. I would say move on to those other technical aspects exactly. of your application on those days and just whatever you do, just keep working on yeah. it and get those parts written and then when the you know yeah. the the mojo comes back for the good writing, you know, get back into part C and keep writing behind your project description. Um, yeah. but, you know, that it all has to be good because that project has to be outstanding. It does. You know, and, and the other parts you can kind of write in more technical ways, especially budget justifications and things like that. Get you can, the but there are better, than better ways you to know, write you them. You can go back and edit them, um, but exactly. you can at least get the information down yeah. on the days when it's not flowing. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's right. And that's what I was saying. You have your little five. I think the track record is the F and G. I have my little. Thing. It takes a lot of work to get that F and G sections going, and the reason is you real you need to check all of your metrics. You need to do careful analyses. You need to make that work throughout. Uh, spend some time on that. It's useful. It's a good diversion, but it's also from you know if yeah. you get stuck. But it's also an important project in its own right. And even if you've written one before. You should tailor it to the project that you're proposing, so you still need to rewrite. And that's exactly right. That's why, from 
from page one to the end. It all you can't copy and paste mm -hmm. too much. The other thing, when you have a team there, you must be so careful to make sure that everything about mm -hmm. each person's track record is consistently done. Mm -hmm. I've read through some of them, and one does it one way, and one does mm -hmm. it another. Out. <laughs> Sorry, but come on, can't you can't you get your act together and be? What, what's your book going to look like? Is it going to be messy like this too? Well, I don't want to. I don't want to pay someone who's going to produce messy work. So uh, it's I'll be able to help with too, and what the person in my role can help with bringing everything together to make it all look consistent in that sort of way. I haven't found so far. To say officer search, there's a person there that I've worked with over the years. It's fantastic. Um, it's, um, I'm blanking on her name, uh, she's coming back from her second maternity leave. Uh, Nadia. Nadia. Yeah. Nadia is my wonderful friend. Uh, they can be helpful in reading the short, the, the, the different summaries, quite helpful there. When they do their um, compliance check, they're not checking anything except compliance. I have not received very much in the way of substantive feedback. They have too many proposals, so I don't ask them to review within the Office of Research. But you're talking about in your role? No, I mean, yeah, my current In yeah. your current yeah. role, yes. So you have time to do it, but you won't be able to do it this time. No. And, but there will be certain And Jenny will. Be but Jenny's very good, mm -hmm. but you'll just have to make sure that I mean, the, the really the only useful feedback is critical feedback, not, oh, this is great and that's wonderful and being concerned with people's feelings, because it's too late for people's feelings. If you want to get this project up, mm. then this is what you're going to have to do. Your reviews are not concerned with the feelings. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I try to work with the kind of um, positive aspects of, of, of something at the start in brainstorming. Oh, I mean the ARC reviewers can't oh. be concerned about your feelings, so oh, you know, you need to exactly. deal with the work you're now. Exactly. Yeah. That's why you need critical feedback. Now, I know you're packing up. I do have one more important thing to say. Do you have to take okay. the bus or something? No, I got a foul uh, prison. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> the cell? Foul cell? No. <laughs> There is one important thing that I need to tell you about in terms of your research plan. It's the biggest tip of the day, which is that when you write that research plan, the, the assessor, the human being making an assessment wants to see action. They want to see you doing something. They don't want abstraction. They want, come on in, that's fine. They want action. So you need to screenplay your research design. It's not your methods, it's your design, the overall design. Think about the project as design. If you just get stuck on methods, that's the, that's the small part, but it's the, um, it's the technical part, I suppose, uh, the design. The design is the overarching set of tasks that you're doing that put the project in its full, full glory and its full importance. And sometimes that means drawing from different uh, domains. I have over the years had study one, study two. There weren't really different studies, but different domains of knowledge that were answering the question. And um, so use screenplay. It looks like Hennessy has a question. No, no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, uh, so screenplay. Now, is that clear when I say screenplay? It means you will use the active voice as compared to the passive voice. And if you don't know the difference, yeah. <laughs> uh, action means that you are saying, I, I or will be doing this. And at last proposal, I use CI throughout. I found that rather easy to do. In the past, I've used I. It doesn't really matter. Um, but I did try CI, and it seemed to work well, because I had to reference myself a lot. I my CI's prize-winning book. Well, I'm not going to say my prize on that. CI's made it a little bit more modest. Um, so uh, you can use either. Of course, if you have multiple CI's, you can use we, and that makes it easier. So I find that people set up the research literature. They might even set up the question well, but the research design falls down, and that's where the project, for me, doesn't 
get funded for those that I say just not as good as others that had all these elements of what they were going to do in the research activity. That needs to be exciting and the assessor wants to see it. Again, they're buying you the idea and something that's plausible and realistic, which is the other thing. Be realistic. Don't say you're going to do this and then that and then this and then that. So no, you can't do all these things. It's not possible. Don't say you're going to be doing that if you can't. Um, I think I'll just stop there. I do have things on team organization and track record, but we have actually already covered that. I can't remember on feasibility and impact. There may be problems. It can be hard to write those sections. I can remember feeling awkward writing those sections. Uh, you might get some ideas reading other proposals on that. Not so much feasibility. You have to think about feasibility. You do need to show a time frame, what you're going to do, what the outcomes are going to be. Now you only have three pages to do it, which means that your, your first page setting up the problem, that's it. You're not going to go even now to a page and a half like we used to. So you really have to get moving very quickly to your plan. I just recall, I don't know if it's changed since, but the last time we did this, it was around quite difficult to find that national priority that I had to fit the project in. Whether you have national priorities or not, there's an equal chance of getting funded. So it doesn't matter. It, it, don't don't force a national priority if you don't have one. I don't. So I never, I rarely talk about waiting, priorities. It's, it's matters in the waiting, doesn't it? It, it no. does form part of the uh, goals of the discovery program to fund, you know, research yeah. in national priority areas. But okay. the so likelihood of being funded is the same whether you have priorities or not. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And so when they changed, like, they're not 12 months ago, 24 months ago, whatever it was, they're really not conducive to much technological research. Yeah. So it's better don't try and make something fit that clearly doesn't. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And another question. Um, is it, sorry, does, does submitting a request for someone not to review raise any red flags, or is that just seen no. uh, unless you nominate a college member? So if you nominate a college of experts member, then it's going to go to the SDBC and the ARC, you're going to consider that very carefully. If it's just a normal request not to assess, you don't have to justify it, that goes into the system. The ARC could overrule it and disregard it, it's possible. Um, I'm not sure actually what the process is there. I've never seen it happen and it's never been notified of it, but it doesn't tend to. I think they just try to take them out. Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people that will nominate people that they've collaborated with, people that will automatically be ruled out of the process. Well, no point. Yeah. You don't need to. They actually are actually really, really good about conflicts of interest like that. Yeah, yeah so no one from your institution or members. Leave the room. They, you know, yeah. When I was down there, they, the UQ proposal was coming up. And, Mm. Yeah, yeah. So that means that you can get a, 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 just another kind of piece of advice on this. <coughs> it's quite important from an ethical perspective, and something I learned from John Braithwaite. Um, remember that if you're going to ask someone to review your proposal, a draft, or you know, whatever, you can ask anyone within Griffith because no one's going to be involved mm -hmm. in reviewing it for the ARC. But it gets more tricky if you want someone outside Griffith who really knows the field. So you need to be clear on what kind of advice you want from them and what level of detail you will receive. So because you get a, you, you, as, as someone uh, receiving a proposal to assess, if you've had substantial conversations or reviews of that proposal, you should not be assessing it. It's ethically not correct. And so I, um, and John said, we just need to do this ethically. Uh, and I agree with that. Maybe some people don't, but I make that clear with people when we're brainstorming or discussing projects that I might be an assessor on. I said, we're going to draw a line between what I can do uh, and can't do if uh, you want me to be able to assess your proposal. So just be careful when you're thinking of reviewers. I think it's a good idea to get reviewers outside the organization if you can. Um, it does help if there are some people out there who wouldn't likely be assessors. Uh, you might also get someone just to, as happened to me once, I got a, um, 
what's the name of the guy who Stephen, the guy who led our GCI uh, event uh, two years ago in January, Steve Stephen Mugford. I sent Stephen Mugford a draft of a proposal, and he edited the first page and just showed me how to write more clearly and plainly. Now, this is someone who I see myself as a good writer. It was really helpful. So if you know someone who's a good editor in that way, uh, it's good to identify someone like that who doesn't even know the field to show you how to write better or how to write in a more communicative way. And in his case, he just crossed out all sorts of words that weren't useful, and that helped me to see. Don't write like that. I you know this was the fourth or fifth grant that I was writing. So uh, it's good to line people up for different aspects of the review. So writing, the idea, there was method, uh, whatever. But they have to ultimately the proposal is going to sink or swim, not just on C but on C plus all the other sections. No, well, there's more stuff to say, but I think it's. I'll tell you when I get my proposal reviews, I get ten to twelve reviewers. That's probably what everyone should be getting. Not two or three, ten or twelve. Thank where you, do you know all your friends. So good luck. Oh, you're not worried about writing a proposal, so you're good. <laughs> So get line people up in advance, know who's going to be in review process one, review process two, and your hardest, hardest reviewer in three. Okay? Yeah. I also get um, like international people that I know are experts in the area and mm -hmm. have a very low chance of being asked to review the proposals mm -hmm. if they're international. Mm -hmm. um, they will ask some international contacts, but... Um, so who know the field really well and can really critique or say, hey, something just emerged in this field, you should be aware of that and build that into mm -hmm. your proposal. And you know, I, I find it useful to get mm -hmm. to get that. It, it is good to get people outside of mm -hmm. they see things differently even if they're not familiar with the AI process. Like, the more and varied intelligences that you can bring to bear, the better. Mm -hmm. You learn from everyone. Yeah. You really do. So, so just so clear, what you would normally do is have, you've got a set of reviewers for that proposal, the project description, and then other people to look at your budget and your budget description. Or no, I don't have anyone look at that. Oh, okay. So it's, it's just the project. What what I probably get Nadia in the Office of Research to vet very carefully are the project descriptions, and they do read those, and they can be very helpful yeah. uh, because they know that that is critical and the language needs to be right. And it can be hard as an academic to write those to a yeah. general audience, but you need to do that. So uh, it's just the C section that I give around to everyone. Yeah. There wouldn't be any reason for me to share the track record, but for some starting out with a DECRA, maybe there would be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I would expect that, that would you'd want advice mm -hmm. on all the sections. Yeah. Um, I'd say... Okay. You, that would be important. You want to make sure yeah, you get your the, exemplars. Would the deck really important to have that narrative of your, your career yeah. so far? That especially with the group. It's something to you. So, yeah. That's why it's important to know what you stand for, or what your contribution is, what makes you distinctive. All of these things that that um, that um, demonstrate to someone who may not know you very well uh, what you do. And why what you do is important. Uh, and it takes, it's not easy to write these kinds of self congratulatory kinds of sentences. I find it very unpleasant. But the, the most important thing there is not so much to do self congratulatory, I suppose, but just that well, you need to kind of chart what you stand for, what you do well, and so forth. And you need to show good data in terms of metrics about what you've done. And don't, don't oversell or overstate. Although there's a, some degree of puffery that goes on that <laughs> yeah. is unfortunate but is part of the game. Yeah. Yeah. But do you need to use the right words. And yeah. A good editor would probably help there. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Do we have any good editors lined up? Any it would be good for people to get some editing yeah. advice. Yeah. <clears throat> I mean, I do line editing, but it is it is really hard work. Oh, it's hard work. I know when um, Lorraine Maserat went through mine, she would just like get rid of all the little words that don't mean anything. Exactly. Was the adverbs, but it was also the little words that you put at the start of the sentence before you get into the meat of the sentence. Yeah. And, you know, I write like that, but now I go back and afterwards yeah. I take it all out. Yeah. That's helped shorten the application too, but it makes it a lot easier to read. Exactly. So you're just so not wasting words on. I think you know it's a good good um, experience to say you have a paragraph. I need to get rid of two sentences. How do you do that? It's amazing mm -hmm. that it, it reads just as well without those yeah. two sentences, <laughs> those, those, <laughs> all those words in those two sentences. Yeah. 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 Um, but I would definitely. I mean, Jenny Wilson can go through your budget and your budget justification with fine tooth comb, and I would suggest that you would go for that, um, especially you know. I mean, I think any time I've got experience in doing budgets and that sort of thing, but I never kind of trust that I've got it all right and what I think is justified might not be clear. And the amount of changes that you make that sometimes you don't realise that you've got to go back and change, tweak something that you have in your budget as well, because everything has to line up. So no, you deserve for that. Um, and I would also get, maybe not the first time, just get. Um, your project description out for review, but definitely get your whole application out for review before you submit it as well, because I think the, you can get feedback on your um, your road sections and all that sort of thing. So I think you really need I, I don't know. Yeah. So I just try not to use people too early for all of that sort of yeah, stuff. Yeah, that's get good. that as good as I can. Yeah, but get the feedback on the project. Yeah. So who is Jenny going to be the point person for managing all of this? Okay. And um, it just needs to be clear what everyone's roles are. Yeah, so I mean, this with Matt only emerged in the last week. We met yeah. with Jenny today yeah. to kind of do a handover and make sure that she is okay to come on board virtually immediately. So we're just signing all of that out and an email will go out. And she's already been made aware of everybody who's submitting a grant um, through the ARC round, so she's going to be in contact with everybody anyway. So, so who is submitting? Lee? Lee. Kirsten? Mm -hmm. Um, Jackie Hummel, Andy, Jackie, right. Andy Kellen, no, no, no. is um, she submitting with somebody else? Yeah, or, um, she's got a couple of people. Yeah, with Mark and Andy. Mark. Um, oh, with Suzanne Korshten. Yep. Yes. Right, right. Yep. And also Michael Townsley, Dan. He, they're going to resubmit. He hasn't come to speak with me. He, he, he has a theory. I, I think that he has, project, <laughs> he has a great project. He has a great project, but nasty reviewers <laughs> kind of idea. Yeah, but I, you know, but he's he's you know he's had a great time. Yeah, he's been really helpful. Yeah, he's going to make some changes. So, yeah. so is Dan? Dan going to be on? Dan will be a PI. Oh, okay, okay. And so that's it. Just five. Yep. Well, that's not yeah. many. No. Oh, we can work with that. Yeah. Yeah. I'll just have to figure out what my role will be. I think I'm definitely working with Suzanne and Yeah, I think so. They've asked me to. Yep. But Yes, you are down as their mentor. Yeah. Oh yeah. And they are um having Sue and Yorick so far do peer reviews, but I'm sure they'll future back I'm sure they'll get some other people as well. So um well, they've been, I mean, York's been successful, Andy's been successful, Mark has, Susanna should know. It's just a matter of how it all comes together. I think that's uh, that's going to be a bit of a problem with and that proposal. Manuel Eisner. Yeah, Claire Tilder. She's been no, successful. She's not, oh, she's not down. But you are down as a reviewer for Mark. So Am I? Okay. That's fine. That's right. He <laughs> asked me. That's right. He okay. asked me. Yes. Yep. 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 Um, I remember that now. And I know you've been providing. Yes, yeah. I'll still work with you. Yeah. Oh, you better get on top of it. Get your work. <laughs> we had a great. Get your file <laughs> help. <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, it's progressing. That's yeah. the concept. Oh, good. <laughs> Excellent. Sounding excited. We'll talk about it on the way down on our Uber mm -hmm. on Sunday. <laughs> well, unless there are any other questions or comments uh, that really you want to make. Really well, it's been great with all your comments as well. It makes it more lively. And uh, all we can do is just do our best, just do our best.
to the very best we can. Um, and I do recommend watching Hard um, right. Quiz tonight yes. for inspiration. I look forward to it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.